Grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A few years ago, a speaker at a youth event where I was present asked the group, how many of you were baptized as children? So my hand shot up like a battle flag defiantly on a firmly rooted pole. And the speaker had spent most of his time talking in such a way as he was disparaging infant baptism. So when he saw my hand go up, he was sort of taken aback. And he said to me, may I ask you to explain why you were baptized as an infant? Well, I will tell you my answer later. But first, I would like for you all to hear God's answer as we go back to the account of Jacob in Exodus chapter 2. There we find the mother of Moses desperately trying to save her son from this cruel and merciless edict by Pharaoh that all Hebrew boys, newborns, be thrown mercilessly into the Nile. Pharaoh doesn't care that these are innocent, helpless babies. All he wants to do is keep the people, the Hebrews, down. Perhaps that describes your world today. Maybe you live in a world of pharaohs where people are trying to keep you down. The government doesn't care that you are a model citizen continues to raise your taxes. Your landlord doesn't care that you are a responsible tenant, keeps raising your rent. And at work, your employers, they don't care that you're a hard worker. They still won't give you a raise or a promotion. And at home, you are a devoted spouse, a dedicated parent, and you still can't get respect. The devil doesn't care that you are a good person. He still wants to take you to hell. Today, we are hearing about how every single one of you are protected from the pharaohs, from the devils, from all of those people who try to put you down because somebody brought you to the water. In the passage from Exodus chapter 2, we come to the place in verse 3 where it says, She, Jacob, got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. She took her son to the water in the sure and certain faith that God would save him. You are saved because somebody brought you to the water. At some time, in some place in your life, you were brought to this water. And God saves you. He saves you not because you are a model citizen, not because you are a responsible tenant, and not because you're a hard worker or a dedicated parent, and not because you are a good person. God saves you because he loves you, and he does care for you, and wants to give you everlasting life. Amen. Amen. God saves all of us through and in and by the waters. God saves us. Now water by itself doesn't care if you are a newborn Hebrew baby. Any Hebrew newborn that was thrown into the Nile would perish. Water does not care if you are a three-year-old boy about to step into the deep end 
of a pool in Sacramento, California. We don't usually think of water as something God uses to save us. We're very slow often to get our children, get ourselves even to this water for that salvation. There are, statistics say, I guess 80% of Christians who actually attend a church where infant baptism is practiced. But there are still other churches that oppose it. Now, I can appreciate a doctrine and a theology that struggles with this idea of baptizing infants. I can appreciate the struggle that um, we may have with this idea of someone who's not yet old enough to fully profess their faith or repent of their sins being baptized. I can even appreciate the idea that we struggle with the sense of a child not being able to decide for themselves who it is that they will follow, what religion they will, they will actually aspire toward. But what I want to tell you today is that Pharaoh doesn't care. The devil doesn't care what your theology is. He doesn't care that your infant's not quite able to profess his or her faith or to repent of sins. Death does not care that your child is not old enough yet to decide what it is they're going to believe. Death comes to snatch even our unborn from our wombs. Therefore, David in his psalm, Psalm 51 says, Surely I was sinful even in my mother's womb, knowing that even there he could have perished. So back when our oldest daughter, Aya, was only a few weeks old, Junko and I had a discussion about having her baptized. She had gone through and was a survivor of a very, very stressful pregnancy. Junko, my wife, carried Aya in some of the most difficult times in our life. Time when we were in Tokyo, applying for a green card, completely uncertain if she would be approved or not. And if she wasn't approved, what would happen to us then? We were in limbo, uncertain of our future, uncertain of what would happen with our child. In stressful times like that, one begins to worry about misca a miscarriage or even a preterm birth. And yet, Aya went the full term. She was born completely healthy. So when we had this conversation about whether or not we would have her baptized, it was pretty clear to her that God had saved her. And we wanted to baptize her in the faith of a God who was always there for her and will always be there for her to give her everlasting life. Death, Satan, does not care that your child is innocent and helpless and powerless to save him or herself. In fact, we may think that we somehow have the ability because we can articulate our faith and, and choose for ourselves that we have the ability to bring our own salvation. But understand, we confess, when we confess our sins, that we are powerless, helpless to save ourselves from our sinful condition. Our sinful nature enslaves us and would take us down and destroy us in as very much as the Pharaoh would do. So in John the Baptist's day, as people came to the Jordan River, they knew they were helpless and powerless to save themselves. They were desperate as they got in that water. They knew they were sinners. They knew they were condemned and doomed, and they had gone there to receive God's mercy. We are powerless just as much as a three-month-old Moses or a three-year-old boy. Powerless to save ourselves. So as we come to the water, we come to the water just as Jacobo did, with this faith and this reassurance that there will be a God who draws us out and gives us everlasting life. 
We are saved in and at and by the water, not because of the water, but because God has put his one and only begotten son in that water. When the three-year-old stepped and dropped into the deep end of the pool, sunk to the bottom. But right there in that water, playing, was another child, a seven-year-old, who from his age as a toddler had learned to swim. He saw that three-year-old going down, and he went down to go get him. Jesus came down from heaven to earth to save us. He came down and went into our grave to raise us up. He went down into hell to proclaim his victory over death. Jesus came down to lift us up and draw us out and bring us to everlasting life. So that seven-year-old boy went all the way down to the bottom of the pool and took that three-year-old by the hand to bring him up to the surface. When those people, those sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, people who stole from others had come to the Jordan River, they were there, desperate, helpless, unable to save themselves. And guess who came? Jesus came and got in that water with them. He was righteous. He knew how to swim. He got in the water to join us in our condemnation so that we join him in his salvation. He came down to join us in death so that we might join him in his resurrection. Jesus got in the water with us to take us by the hand, to lift us up and bring us up to the surface. We are saved in and by and through the water because God put his one and only begotten son in the water there to save us. So this seven-year-old had brought this three-year-old up from the bottom of the pool. Other adults came in and they, they brought him to the deck and he still wasn't breathing. So they engaged in CPR, some chest compressions and some breath. We are saved from drowning because God also breathes into us. When Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples and it says, he breathed on them his Holy Spirit. Even in Genesis chapter 1, right in the very beginning, Guess who's hovering over the surface of the deep? It's the Holy Spirit of God, ready to rush in with life and bring us and make us beings who are alive. It says, Adam became a living being because God breathed into him the breath of life. God breathes into us at baptism, promises us his Holy Spirit, those life giving breaths of life that sustain us, that create faith in us, that make us righteous, that wash away our sinfulness, that promises everlasting life. It is here then, as we shared in the children's message, that God continues to breathe on all of you, does his CPR. He breathes into you his word of God. He breathes into you as we sing and pray together. He breathes it into you through the preaching and the reading and the sharing of the word. He breathes into you as we confess together that he is our Lord and Savior. So as those adults were, were doing the chest compressions and the breaths, that three-year-old coughed up water and he began to breathe. And so God breathes into you his Holy Spirit and you live. God saves us in and by this water because he put his son in that water because he breathes the Holy Spirit 
into us in that water and grants us everlasting life. Jacobed is an example of a person who trusts in God's mercy at the water. And that she was willing to put her wee three-month-old child in a basket on the bank of this river, trusting and knowing that God somehow, some way would keep him alive. We come to the baptismal font in this same faith as Jacobin, that God will also keep us alive. So often we look at the water as something that might kill us. We often avoid it. We stay away from it. But God invites us who are helpless, powerless, who are condemned to come to that water where we will join his son in the promise of everlasting life, where we will receive his Holy Spirit and be given life and the faith to live everlasting. So when that speaker asked me, why were you baptized as an infant? I'm thinking about Jacobet in this story. But I'm also thinking about this one other thing. And I answer him. I said, because God always, and hear me, God always keeps his promises. Baptism is God's promise to every single one of us. And so I asked the group, how many of you have kept your promises to God? Anyone, show your hands. No one could raise their hand. We all failed our promises. But I asked them, does God ever break his promises? No, he does not. God keeps all of his promises. Baptism is God's promise to me. Even when I'm helpless, even when I trip and stumble, even when I'm a sinner and cannot keep my vows to God, God always keeps his that he made to me in baptism. Baptism is God's promise that he will, just as he did for Moses, draw us out and give us everlasting life. The story of this three-year-old falling into the pool is just a, a modern-day reminder that even as we fall into the water, God has put someone there, his son there, to save us. And here's an interesting thing about the story. Um, I couldn't have made this up. Do you want to know what the name of the seven-year-old was who, who actually rescued this boy? His name was, listen to this, Messiah Brown. The three-year-old was saved by a Messiah. And church, all of you are saved by the Messiah. Amen? Amen? He got in the water with us. He grabbed us by the hand and drew us out and gave us everlasting life. That is the promise that I lay down before you today in the story of Jacobin. That as you have come to the water, however, whenever you got there, God has made this promise that he will save you and give you everlasting life. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So let us now.